Well, thanks for coming. Thanks for your interest. And um, I just wanted to ask you if in the beginning, who of you live with bees? So do you see uh, when I, in preparation of this, um, I walked into my garden and I saw this rose geranium. And maybe you, you can see that leaf of rose geranium and had a, it had water, dew, collected. And it's, you, you, can you see the water right there? And I was holding it. It was almost drinking it. And what struck me was not the mechanics of catching water, but rather that's the, that the entire world, the entire entangled biosphere, created dynamics which are such a match that this sentient being, like the rose geranium, um, has the perfect shape for drinking water. And also, not only that, but water knows how to come to the mouth of this uh, rose geranium. It, is, it just struck me as how intimate, interdependent all life forms are on this planet. And it struck me, especially in the context of Apis mellifera, our dear honeybee. And I want to touch on those complexities which are mirrored through, the, through and in the life of that life form, of that phenomenon. So I, I um, founded this organization called Apis Arborea, and the Latin name of the honeybee is Apis mellifera, and in its name is Meli, the honey, and um, that focusing on the commodity in the form of honey was one of the factors which uh, is a driving, it's a driving factor in the destruction of this animal. And we all live in a time where we have to reinvent language to reflect a, a new more holistic rea reality. And so why not calling this, why not defining this phenomenon, this animal, through its habitat, which originally has been for millions of years in, within a tree. So I call it Apis arborea. This is the reason for the change of name. <clears throat> so Apis arborea. And uh, what we do is, it was founded to honor the essential role of bees in sustaining life on our planet and to ensure the health and survival of bees and thus all beings. Since Apis arborea is a keystone species, and what is the keystone, right? In the old Roman arches, we can still identify the keystone. It's literally one stone holding it all. And the moment that one keystone is removed, the entire arch will collapse. So the question here is, what would happen if Apis mellifera, if a key, as a keystone species, would disappear? What would happen to the arch of life? The current crisis of Earth's ecosystem calls for radical redesign of the ways we live with bees. And because, um, and I want to get there, so I have to speed up a little bit. Uh, just a few slides of which illustrate a little bit uh, the time and space we live in. And this is kind of abundant in this kind of conference with the biodiversity, the loss of biodiversity, what also is called the great acceleration. Um, then, of course, um, extinction rate when it comes to invertebrates and insects, uh, also uh, uh, called the insect apocalypse. You probably have read that article earlier this year. And um, I just want to share a little bit advantage of the conventional narrative. We all are facing the challenge uh, to break out of narratives. But for, before we can do this, we have to understand what we are believing. And often it's an old narrative, an old identity. And I want to show you something about this um, old narrative. So this is uh, something I put together just to sh give you a sense of um, animal factory farming in the absence of ethics. 
So you see, this looks quite normal probably to most of you. It's just white bee boxes, how quaint in, in, in that setting. When, when you look closer, you'll see all those things like those dead bees. They're just, um, it's a, a normalcy of conventional beekeeping. Death, medication, poison, destruction, and most of all, there's the absence of providing a species adequate nest habitat. And I have some sound here, maybe I can... Oh, hey. And it goes so far that even body tissue is replaced with plastic implants. Those, those little frames, they're called foundation. But there is, it's a total euphemism. It's nothing foundational about those frames. It is an implant. And when you think it's in a nutshell for you guys, what comb is, comb is an organ which includes being the womb, being all kinds of inner organs. It's part of the immune system. It's a communication system. It's the comb wide web. It's so many things. And, but what if we are blind to that reality, there's no reason not to replace that living substance and organ with just plastic. And that's been done. It's kind of the ultimate disregard, the, the ultimate ignorance of life, really. And there is a term someone coined, that person called it soul blindness. That is, if we cannot recognize a soul quality in all living creatures on this earth, that will lead to destruction, necessarily. One more thing about the conventional narrative, and that is, so often people want to start with bees. They want to do good, because bees, they, they, it's, they are in crisis. So people say, I will become a beekeeper. And I want to show you what happens. And so those people go to the store and order packaged bees, thinking, I want, to be, I want to be good. I will do something really good. But no one knows the background, the backstory of those bee packages. What's really, what are they? What they are is they, they are the product of a Frankenstein operation. They are the essence of a destructive, almost concentration camp style of animal farming. And it just spreads diseases. It, by, by buying packaged bees, we're supporting all causes which are killing bees, as crazy as that may be. And it's so heartbreaking because we want to be good. We want to do good. We want to support honeybees. And then this shows how they're all put together. There's nothing natural about those. It is just a Frankenstein operation, really. It's heartbreaking at best. It's so commercial beekeeping operations are non-regulated. So you can do whatever you want with that living, this sacred being, right? It's a sacred being. And it is, it is really factory farming at its, at its worst. And I know so many, I've seen so many people who leave the store with a package bee, uh, um, uh, with a package of bees under their arms, being so happy, feeling like I'm saving the world now. It is just horrific. Instead of and now we are now I want to I want to look at the other side, right? So now we kind of understand a little bit more that ingrained old narrative. So now what are the options? And now we are getting into the excitement because we are living in a time of crisis, and that means we are living in an extremely creative time, full of opportunity, full of forward-looking, uh, um, full of vision. <clears throat> Can you see that a little bit? Um, so I want to I want to skip what climate crisis does to bees, but one thing I do want to um, 
uh, share with you is that those people, they looked at goldenrod uh, pollen and they had some from 1842 and then they looked, they, they, they looked at some golden red pollen from goldenrod pollen from 2014 and looked at the differences. And one difference was that the pollen, the protein content was 30% lower. And that was due to increased carbon dioxide uh, content in the atmosphere. And that's just one example. On so many levels, climate crisis um, is affecting honeybees. And of course, not only honeybees, but honeybees are uh, interlinked and entangled to such a high degree with the entire landscape and um, watershed, with all living beings, with the co complete biotic environment, that any changes are being picked up from, from honeybees. That's why they're not only a, a, keynote, a, a keystone species, they're an indicator species, because they reveal what's happening in the subtle realm of the biotic realms. So <clears throat> we are in that system change time frame, right, where the old paradigm is dying. We have to provide hospice services for that, which is outside of us, but also inside of us. And we are in this time of pioneering edge walkers, pathfinders. That's why we are all here, um, because there's this... Uh, the, we are at the beginning of the rise of an alternative system and an alternative way of being on this planet. And I want to show you this. You see those spheres, how they move initially, and now patterns are being created. And we are at a time where we have to understand those patterns. We have to identify those patterns because it's about developing totally different ways of being on this planet which also includes our own sense of self. So we cannot only do restorative agriculture in the outside, but we have to do it inside as well. It's pretty crazy, right? <clears throat> so I'm going to skip out of that. And I want to now show, get to um, what we do. Um, I want to show you this Apis arborea is putting everything upside down and approach, approaches the phenomenon of Apis mellifera from the perspective of bees. And that begins with studying bees where they live for millions of years and also to realize that 98% 90, of all scientific research on honeybees is done in the zoo, meaning in square boxes. It is the equivalent of studying wild tigers in the zoo. And you have to figure out as a scientist, why do they like to pace in front of the screen? That is the equivalent of contemporary mainstream entomological research. So we are just at the dawn of new research data, which really researches true Apis mellifera in its indigenous habitat. And that's what Apis Arborea does as an organization. It follows Apis Arborea. It follows honeybees throughout all their life gestures. And this, for example, is a, tr is a nest cavity which is carved into a living tree. And that is a thousand-year-old art which has been practiced in Central Europe, like I said, for thousands of years. And one step removed is um, to provide bees with log hives, hollowed out log hives. And so it, it becomes all of a sudden super exciting because you try to identify instinctual preferences and then how can we match them? One of which is bees love to live 20, up to 20 feet off the ground and not, they don't belong to the ground. They, are, they belong up in trees. And with it comes a different microbiome. The microbiome on, on Earth level is extremely different and other conditions as well. But once we are up there, it's a whole different world.
There are lots of videos at ar apisarborea.com if you want to go there at some point. Um, hmm? Apis, A-P-I-S, Arborea, A-R-B-O-R-E-A.com. Oh, here, here it is. <coughs> and now um, I want to show you a short video which shows you how we built them. And then if we have enough time, a short one which shows one of the projects where we installed it at a, a newly planted apple orchard. We'll skip a few things because we don't have time. So uh, while you're watching, again, we have to identify instinctual preferences, one of which is that the natural nest volume of this being is about 10 gallons max. And um, while you watch how it's built, I want to ponder about volume because one regular Langstroth box is 40, is 10 gallons. A Langstroth box, so those wide square boxes you see everywhere, which were in the, okay, those are the conventional boxes. One box alone is already the max nest size of this animal, but uh, they pile up three, four stories and exceed it three to four times. And contemporary studies show now that that has an, a negative impact on health and survival rates on all levels. In terms of varroa mites, for example, um, if the volume is threefold above the, the natural volume, the increase is by 300% in the mites. Just, just to give you a, a taste of what I'm talking about, that the, the, in the through the design, we empower so many dynamics which serve the health and the resiliency of this animal and the longevity. Um, not necessarily. The, 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 if you, um, with one exception of s certain kind of cedar trees which have high volatiles, the ones you use to not allow moths to go into your closet, I wouldn't choose those, but other than that, it's quite, there are lots of options. The harder the wood, the, the more difficult it is to work uh, with a tree. Um, and, um, and the concept is once we have identified those basic design parameters of the natural nest, then um, we can set them up in trees and have them be self-populating. Because we are facing, and that's true for so many areas in, in you know, what we are all talking about here at this conference, there's often not, not an infrastructure in place for us to get back to. You, know, you cannot just order at Amazon a log hive or there is not such a thing. So we and that's what I mean, it's so exciting in some ways where we, in the time we live in because it forces us to be creative and it forces us to listen to all kinds of, uh, to, to employ all our senses really for the time we live in. And then that's the final installation, they're up there. Of course they're prepared to, to make it, uh, to help bees find them. Uh, right, exactly. So what, what we do is we're using uh, propolis. Are you familiar with propolis? Propolis is a, a resin foraged for by honeybees. And then, so it's very st a sticky substance which smells so strongly. And the life of honeybees is all about scent. And so that is applied as a tincture as well as uh, empty uh, comb. And that is very strong. And maybe we have time for one more, um, and that's this one. So that shows you know, an installation uh, within an orchard, and, um, the, and this is part of something which is called low capiary. It's a play on locavore. 
it's a local watershed apiary. Now the next step is it's not only it's not enough to provide a, a 100% holistic nest environment for honeybees. Now the next step is this animal for is is interconnected with the surrounding 8,000 acres. Now we have to work with the watershed and we have to work with the people in the watershed and the conditions in the watershed. And low capiary is the idea of taking Apis mellifera, the honeybee, out of the narrative of ownership and place honeybees into the realm of air, soil, light and warmth which doesn't belong to anyone, but rather is a, co a constituent of life. Because honeybees are not a commodity, they are a foundation of life. And therefore, the new narrative is one of collaboration, of networking, and creating watershed-wide conditions which allow and support Apian dynamics which end up in resiliency and surviving honeybees. Because currently the, the annual mortality rate of honeybees in this country is about 42%. So 42% of 2.5 million registered beehives that puts us at about 1 million hives are dead, we should reframe that, are being killed every year and multiply each of those one million hives by how many individual bees inside, let's call it 180,000. And some of the calculator can give us the number how many bees are killed every year in this country. So um, that is the challenge. This is the opportunity for us to create completely, radically new narratives and programs in, through which we can become um, modern stewards of life and not people who rob honey. We, we truly left this old paradigm, it's so obsolete because I mean, we see it in all the statistics, right? We see it in, in, through the fact that we entered the, that we created the Anthropocene. We live in an altered reality. We are outside of normalcy. It is, we lo left the epoch of normalcy. We left the epoch of the, of a promised future. And, 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 in the context of honeybees, this sacred being, which in some native cultures were, they attributed them as, they characterized honeybees as the holder of space and time. Where the, the, the sale of honey was forbidden. Get that, I mean, how crazy is that? Um, even central, old, his, uh, traditional central European um, wisdom was extremely strict around honeybees, where if you would, they, they would have, you would have a two-week window in the entire year to cut a small portion of honey. If you were caught outside that time window, you very likely would lose your life. There was a death penalty on there. And I'm just trying to give you a sense of how our ancestors understood this being and its role and quality. And they could still understand the true meaning of a keystone species holding up the arch of life. Okay? And um, that's just, I think, a super cute moment in their lives which shows that honeybees even have relationship, intimate relationship with snails. 
Yes, and if it's too far away, but if you look closer, you will see that the snail is feeding on, off that what the honeybees have dropped, and the honeybees are licking the snail. They're kissing her. That's that's just a regular wild California snail, a slug, a slug. Okay, sorry. Well, but but now the bees were native to the old world. They weren't here. Good example of such a dusty narrative. People always say it's the European honeybee. It's not native, right? That's and it's true, but let's let's co- make that complete that statement. Let's include. Are you Caucasian? Yeah. Okay, so that includes you. That includes a lot of people here. That includes our entire agricultural system, with the exception of corn. This includes every single fruit you can buy and eat here. That includes rats. That includes earthworms. All grains, everything. But there is someone who thinks that it's beneficial to single out honeybees and say, oh, well, it's called the European honeybee. They don't belong here almost. But, but there is, when you continue, the, I'm just telling you, it's a beautiful example what you bring up because it shows us our own blind spots. We don't say to someone who's selling wheat bread, well, that's a little bit funny. It's, oh, it's interesting to remember that wheat is actually not native to this continent. You, you know what I mean? So, but am I correct in saying that um, there were not native honeybees? Correct. Okay. So what about killer bees? Killer bees do not exist. Killer beekeepers exist. Well, so... <laughs> <laughs> that the killer bees were also imported, that the killer bees nest in the ground, which is why they're so dangerous, because you step on them and they can kill. And many years ago, in a class, I asked, well, how did they manage the killer bees in the old world? And the professor said, well, there was a buffer species in between. But really what happened? Yeah, I, I think... Yeah, so it's about killer bees, and I would like to reframe it. It's such a great topic because it's so juicy, but the, true, the truth lies somewhere else. And I don't want to diminish what you're bringing up. There are answers to what you're bringing up. But in this context, I would say we are not talking about global trading. And you know what I mean? No, no because... The, 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 the killer bees don't kill anyone. They're just being co- a phenomenon. It's just called killer bees. But the true killing, there's killing happening. Like I said in the statistics, trillions of bees are being killed. They're not dying. They're not dying because the, mo- the stars didn't line up. They're being killed. Yeah. What's the relationship with the bee and the slug? Yeah, what's the relationship between the bee and the slug? It, um, it's on many levels. Uh, one thing one could say, and it may sound funny to you, but is they're both light beings. They have a relation to soul and warmth and light. And I find it so interesting that they both came together like this. I, I witnessed them by accident one early morning in one of my hives. But um, what I found... So, there's so much to say, but I want to say one more thing, to, which has to do with to witness that slug. It's a slug, right? I always get them mixed up. To witness this um, connection between honeybees and slug, slugs stands for something else. It symbolizes a certain kind of quality of honeybees. And I want to, I want to just admit maybe the last thing I can share with you. And it has to do with um, a very unique matrix of life, honeybees and body. And I want, to, I want to illustrate that in a few examples. So we may think they're an insect. 
and yet they are a mammalian being. We may think like all insects, they are cold-blooded, but this is actually a warm-blooded animal. We may think there are 30,000 individual bees and that's a colony, when in truth it's, it's a singularity of a being. It's one single being. When we perceive this being in its multitude, we will not see the true being. In other words, those individuals are not truly individuals, but they also have the quality of somatic cells. So if, I, if we relate to each other, we relate to the personhood in each other. I'm not relating to the tip of your nose or just to your earlobe, okay? But it, that's where honeybees become this very intricate, inspirational opportunity for human beings in this time and space and the time of crisis because it embodies a, a new paradigm of, um, of life. It, it shows us way, ways of self, of living in, in, a, in an ecology of selves on this planet, which at its foundation has values we are striving towards to in monasteries and often in other contexts too. One of, some of which are altruism, right? On the, it's this, the foundational quality of this phenomenon of apis mellifera is altruism. The next one right up is service. Service to an extent that everything, every tissue within is medicinal, Calm, propolis, honey, pollen, everything is medicinal. There's nothing which is not medicinal, you know, in the context of service. But then think of even eating, meaning foraging. So foraging is life giving. It grants, it gives life. Um, just to give you a flavor of the matrix of life, what this is. Um, it is. It is as if it embodies the next step in human development. For us to shed old narratives and walk ahead on this planet in crisis in a way without having mental constructs, but to also allow to walk without knowing, to invite a different kind of guidance into our lives. One where we may not be able to name the source, but it lives within us and we all know, yeah, anyway. That's where I feel we are. That's why we have, the whole conference touches on so many levels of the same thing. That it's time. I mean, we are all in, linked to a revolution, a, re, a, a revolution. We are all linked to a collapse to a death and a birth. And the birth cannot follow mental constructs we perceived in the area of death. Yeah. So the question was, if he would put up a, a log hive, he's still affected by all the many beekeepers around him. And that's why I said earlier in the beginning, we need to collaborate. We cannot solve this problem in our backyards. It has to be much wider. That's why I'm, I developed this program called Low Capiary. It's a reaching out to environment. And so much more to say about this. But I also want to tell you, uh, don't feel bad to have Langstroth hives. I'm not here to judge you. I'm just here to share uh, new information 
and it's just the paradigm of Langstroth of those conventional hives is just falling apart. And that's all it is, and we just, it's a continuous uh, uh, learning every day, not only pertaining to apiculture, but for all of us in agriculture. I mean, how, how many things did we do 10 years ago we will not do today? And same with honeybees. Um, so don't feel judged, just feel inspired. That's the whole trick. The idea of raw capillary, what it means is that you're reintroducing natural dynamic systems which pollinate your orchard. And that's a longer story, we're out of time, but that's another additional link to low capillary. The question was, uh, does it, uh, uh, is, uh, in living in the Anthropocene, is there room for consuming honey? Is the, by a human being. And um, by a human being. And I would say yes, but it cannot be the, the driving force behind your operation. And um, just, I do eat honey, but I only um, uh, uh, receive the honey from dyed hives. Because I, I think it's right now really important to let that completely go and focus on survival. Thank you very much.